All right, greetings everyone. Uh, the purpose of this video is to uh, go over an example of finding all of the real zeros given a polynomial like the one that we see here on the screen um, using a completely algebraic process. Now for a function like this, we could graph it and look for all of the um, points where it physically crosses the horizontal axis to find the real zeros. Um, However, we are going to go through a process here um, that will show how we can do that algebraically. And this is kind of a three-step process, as you see here on the slide. So the first thing we're going to do is use what's called Cauchy's bound to find an interval that all of those real zeros should fall in. Uh, then we'll use the rational roots theorem to make a list of possible zeros, so to come up with a list of candidates for our zeros. And then finally, with that information, we'll find all of the zeros. Now, before we do that, just um, to show you uh, the information about Cauchy's bound, as well as the rational roots theorem, the interval we get from Cauchy's bound comes from this formula here, this negative m over the absolute value of a sub n minus 1, and then m over the absolute value of a sub n plus 1. And that value m comes from the coefficients in your um, polynomial, whichever has the largest absolute value. And then a sub n is that leading coefficient. So whichever number is next to the variable with the highest power. In the rational roots theorem, um, what we do is we look at factors or numbers that divide both our constant terms or so a number added at the end, as well as our leading coefficient, which um, again is at a sub n. And then we create ratios with those. That's where the term rational comes from. We make ratios. And those ratios that we get are um, what allow us to then um, kind of do some experimentation to figure out what the rational, uh, what the zeros are of the function. OK, so let's look at how this works in practice. So we're going to start with Cauchy's bound. And to find Cauchy's bound, we first need to identify two values in the polynomial. So we first find that value capital M, which comes from the coefficient with the highest uh, absolute value. And then we also identify A sub N, which is our leading coefficient. Looking at the um, polynomial that we're given, and I apologize, <laughs> hit the wrong button here. Looking at the coefficient that we are given, the coefficients we're given in our polynomial, we can see that the largest absolute value is going to belong to this number right here, the negative 44. And the absolute value of that is positive 44. So that's going to be our value m. And then our leading coefficient is 6. So that will be our value for a sub n. So that will be 6. Then we simply just plug those numbers into that formula. So that negative m over the absolute value of a sub n minus 1, comma, capital M over the absolute value of a sub n plus 1. So if we plug those numbers in, we'll have negative 44 over the absolute value of 6 is 6, minus 1, up to positive 44 over 6, plus 1. And if we go ahead and plug those numbers in a calculator, just to kind of give us something a little bit more concrete to think about, we come out with all of the real zeros or the rational zeros of this uh, polynomial function are going to lie between the values negative 8.333 and positive 8.333. And that's useful for us because in the next step, we're going to make a list of potential options of numbers that may be rational zeros to this function. And in that list, we may get numbers that don't fall within this interval between these two values. And in that case, those are numbers we can eliminate or disregard because we know they're not going to be zeros of the function. OK, let's go on to the next step then. So now we're going to use the rational roots theorem again, to create a list of possible rational zeros. And the way that we do this is we start by identifying these values P and these values Q. The values P come from the 
factors or the numbers that divide our constant term, which we re uh, represent with a sub zero. So all the factors of negative 15 or really just 15. Um, and so if we think about it, the number, all the numbers that divide 15 are one, three, five, and 15. The reason being for that, right? One times 15 is 15. Three times five is 15. Those are the only possibilities. And then for the values Q, we do the same thing, but this time we use the leading coefficient. So the A sub N, again, that coefficient of the variable with the highest power, that in this case is six. And if you think about it, the co or the factors of six are one, two, three, and six. And um, we know that because one times six is six, and two times three is six. And again, that's all we've got. Okay, so those are our values for P and Q. And then to finally, to make our list, and this is where things start to get a little long, right? Because we have to do all possibilities. So one over everything down here, whoops, uh, then five, three over everything down there, five over everything down there, and then 15 over everything down there. So I'm actually going to do this in the way where I'm going to start with doing all values of P over the first value of Q, which is one. So we'd have plus or minus one over one, then plus or minus three over one, then plus or minus five over one, and plus or minus 15 over one. Okay. And then I'll continue on by now taking all of those values and putting them over the second value of Q, which is two. So we'd have plus or minus one half, plus or minus three halves, plus or minus five halves, and then plus or minus 15 halves. All right, and then we'll continue on with the next value three. So plus or minus one over three. We would do plus or minus three over three next, but three over three we know is the same as one over one. And we've already got that in the list, so I'm not gonna write that again. So then we would have plus or minus five over three, and then plus or minus 15 over three, but again, that's the same as five over one, so I won't write that. And then we'll continue on to the last one. So we'll do plus or minus one over six, plus or minus three over six, but that would be one half. We've already got that in our um, list. We have plus or minus five over six, and then plus or minus 15 over six, but 15 over six uh, reduces again to five halves. And we've already got that in our list. Okay, so this list of numbers here um, is now our candidates for possible zeros. And I know looking at this list, it looks like a lot of numbers, right? So it's kind of difficult to know where to start. Um, but we can also eliminate some of these because remember that um, back here we saw that all zeros of this function need to fall between negative 8.333 and 8.333. If we take a look at our list, there's at least one value or two values. These ones right here, 15 over 1. So we can go ahead and eliminate those. And though that didn't pare our um, list down much, it pared it down some, right? Okay. So now we've got all these candidates, we're gonna figure out, use um, them to try to find some, some or at least one of the zeros here. And unfortunately, this is where this just becomes a lot of guess and check. And I would say typically when we're doing this, we wanna start with and hope that some of the easier values, so some of these simple ones like one over one or three over one will work. So we're gonna go ahead and start with those. And the way we test them is we'll use synthetic division. So if I start with the first number on the list, which is positive one over one, which is just positive one, I'm going to perform synthetic division using the coefficients from our polynomial. And what we're looking for here is that we're gonna end up with a zero at the end of the, um, the synthetic division process. So let's see if that happens here. So if I write all those values out, the 6, 5, negative 44, and negative 15, I will go ahead and bring down the 6. 
multiply that by the number in the corner, which is one, we get six again, five and six is 11. Multiply that by one, we get 11, negative 44, that's negative 33 times one is negative 33. And when we add that to negative 15, we get negative 48. And unfortunately this doesn't work, right? Cause we didn't get a zero here at the end. That's okay. Um, no harm, no foul there. We'll just keep on going. So I'll try the next value on the list, which was negative one. So we'll again, write out the coefficients, the six, five, negative 44 and negative 15. All right, and we can start by bringing down the six. And then we go through the process again. So six times negative one is negative six. Five minus six is negative one. Negative one times negative one is positive one. Negative 44, negative 43 times negative one. We get positive 43 minus 15. We end up with 28 here. Again, we do not get zero, unfortunately. So that didn't work. So two attempts, uh, no success yet. Um, the next number in our list was positive or negative three. I'm gonna change things up here. I'm gonna start with the negative number this time. So I'm gonna start with negative three. Go ahead and list out the coefficients here. All right, and I may run out of room down here at the bottom, but we bring down the six again to start. Sorry, let me just try that a little better. There we go. So we'll bring down the six to start. Six times negative three. Um, that's going to be negative 18. Plus five is negative 13. Times negative three, that's positive 39. Negative 44 and negative 39 is negative five. Negative five times negative three is positive 15. And this time when we add negative 15 and positive 15, we get a zero. So that is good news because now we know that X equals negative three is a zero of this function, okay? What that also tells us is we can use the leftover numbers down here at the bottom along with that zero to write our function up here in a factored form which will then allow us to find the rest of the zeros. So what will that look like? Well, it'll be h of x. And we know since negative three is a zero, that x plus three is a factor of that function. And then we can use these numbers here to write uh, what that has to be multiplied by to get h of x. So we start with the six there. We know that it'd be multiplied by six x squared minus 13 x minus five. And part of the reason I know that this starts with 6x squared, right, is if we multiply 6x squared times the x here, that gives us 6x cubed, which is our leading coefficient on our original function, okay? And now all we have to do is go ahead and find the zeros of this function, or this factored form, and we'll be good to go. So let's do that on the next slide. So right now we've got h of x factored to x plus three times that six x squared minus 13 x minus five. To find the zeros, we take each of these pieces and set it equal to zero. So we do x plus three equals zero and then six x squared minus 13 x minus five equals zero. The x plus three we know that gives us x equals negative three if we add three to both sides there. And then to solve the second part, we can um, either factor or I'm gonna go ahead and use the quadratic formula knowing that these coefficients here are a, b, and c. So I use my formula that x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus four ac all over two times a. We go ahead and plug the numbers from up above. We'll have negative of negative 13 plus or minus the square root of negative 13 squared minus four times six times negative five, all divided by two times six. 
All right. And if we work that out there, I'm going to skip some steps here. We'll end up with 13 plus or minus the square root of 289 all over 12. 289, this may be surprising, but that comes out as uh, a uh, that 289 is a perfect square. So this comes out actually as 13 plus or minus 17 over 12, which if we do the two answers there, 13 plus 17 is 30 over 12. 13 minus 17 is negative 4 over 12. And if we reduce both of those answers, we end up with 5 halves and negative 1 third as the other two zeros, which is kind of cool because if we look back at our list, I believe those were both on the list there. Okay. So now we've got that those two answers. We've got the x equals negative 3 here. So what we know that are that the zeros of this function are x equals negative 3, positive 5 halves, and negative 1 third. And one last thing to notice is notice uh, is that our power or our degree, excuse me, of our original function was 3, and we ended up with three zeros. So there's probably some sort of a correlation there. All right, that is it for now. Thank you for watching.